All right. I'd like to ask you to take a moment. You can even close your eyes if you like. And visualize yourself walking in to a cocktail party or reception, kind of like the one we were all attending before we walked in. Picture yourself walking in and you don't know a soul. Can you see it? Who do you think you will most likely gravitate towards? Well, I'm here to tell you that probably it will be someone who has similarities to you or that at least you think has similarities to you. You start engaging in the mingling and the small talk in the hopes of finding a common connection. You might ask questions like, what brings you here? Do you know anybody here? What kind of work are you in? And the reality is, is that you're asking these questions in the hopes, in the hopes of finding some common and shared experience something that will bring you together with that person because you share something in common. You see, we live in a world that's so diverse, filled with people of all different shapes and sizes, religions, cultures, races, and world perspectives. But in a world full of differences, people prefer those who are similar to them. We gravitate towards similarities. We prefer those who are similar to us because of the reinforcing effects that this provides. I feel like I'm looking in the mirror. This is my niece, Sophia. Isn't she adorable? Well, she's looking in the mirror and saying, how cute am I? I'm going to kiss myself. And this is what happens when we find similarities in others. The characteristics that resemble our own help to validate who we are. We're even biased to arbitrary similarities, such as having the same birthday with someone, having the same name, or even just having the same initials. Now, an interesting fact is that even little babies have this innate bias. Little babies younger than Sophia. There was a study out of the University of Chicago and Harvard that found that babies as young as three to six months, they look at people who speak the same language as their caregiver, have the same accent, or just are from the same race. There was a recent segment on 60 Minutes that a friend of mine who's here said, you have to watch this. And it focused on studies that were coming out of the baby lab at Yale. And in these studies, they focused on the foundations of morality and the origins of bias towards similarities. So what they did here is that they showed the babies two different snacks to choose from. And then they showed them these puppets that were choosing the same snacks from the same snacks. And they also showed them a play scheme where the babies, um, I'm sorry, where the puppets were playing and one of them hurt the other puppet. Now, when they put the puppets in front of the little kid, the baby, who do you think that baby chose? Which puppet? The one that chose the same snack. And even more interesting than that, the babies were choosing the puppet that caused harm to the one that was different than them. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, when I learned this, I had my moment of insight, a wow moment, because I said, if we're born predisposed to similarities, how in the world are we really supposed to accept differences and give everyone, especially people with disabilities, a fighting chance at having an equal opportunity? So I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with many people with disabilities, specifically autism over the last 15 years. And I have grown to see the similarities that we really all share with them. And so I want to share that with you tonight so that you too can spread the word and help these individuals to have equal opportunities in our world. But before I do that, I want to share with you a guilty pleasure that I have. Now don't judge me, but I'm sure that some of you out there like reading cheesy entertainment magazines because after a stressful week at work, you need something to clear the mind. My favorite magazine is Us. Anybody out there? Us? All right. Well, there's a featured section called Stars. They're just like us. And the reason um, that they have this uh, section is that they show pictures of famous people doing everyday ordinary things. Like here's P. Diddy. He's wiping his face. Mariah's riding on a roller coaster. The Little Bear is reading Us magazine. And it's, it's there to show you that even famous people, they're just like you. 
They do ordinary, everyday things. They get speeding tickets, take out the garbage. They're just like you. Well, I'm here to tell you that people with autism, they do ordinary, everyday things, and sometimes they even do extraordinary things. And I'm going to show you some examples by piggybacking on the idea of my favorite magazine. <coughs> they go to the golf range, and they practice their golf swing. People with autism go to school. People with autism like to cook at home. People with autism are Miami Dolphins fans waiting for that autograph from their favorite player. They're also people who go to work. They want to be productive citizens in our society, and they want to go to work, and they do. People with autism are just like us. Now, by a raise of hands, and I won't be able to see that well, how many of you know someone with autism, or at least know someone who has autism in their life? Wow, OK. I'm not surprised, and I'll tell you why. The Center for Disease Control put out a report last year stating that one in 88 children have an autism spectrum disorder. And just Wednesday, hot off the press, the CDC put out a new report stating that one in 50 children ages 6 to 17 have autism. One in 50. So you would be hard pressed not to know someone with autism, not to have a family member with autism, or at least know someone with autistic-like characteristics. Now before the movie Rain Man, most people hadn't even heard of autism. Autism? What's that? But then now it's become a bit of a buzzword, more commonplace. We're even seeing a big push of autism in the media, where you see characters with autism depicted in various TV shows that are quite popular right now. And this has been really great because it's helped to promote autism awareness and help you as the public to feel more connected to the experiences that people with autism have. My only problem with this is that I don't feel that they really highlight the abilities that these individuals have that fall within their disability. What I mean by that is that characteristics such as impaired social interactions, repetitive behaviors, restricted and obsessive interests can actually be beneficial in certain fields of work, such as in the field of technology. So given the right environment, a person with autism can actually be a very powerful person in the workforce. But we must begin to define them not by their disabilities, but by their highly useful skills. Now I want to tell you about this really cool company in Denmark. It's called Specialistern. Now this company hires uh, about 35 consultants with autism, and they're hired uh, to work for different companies to do tedious and often technical jobs, like when a new cell phone comes out, they have to test it over and over again for glitches. And they have to test it and test it until some little glitch comes out. Or they have to compare digital and written uh, medical records to ensure accuracy of, du of duplication. Now, the guy who developed this company, he has a kid with autism. And as his kid was growing up, he saw that there were a lot of deficits, but his child could do some really amazing things. So he came up with the premise saying, there are some people with autism that have these abilities that are necessary for jobs that other people find boring, but yet his consultants are so successful, and they succeed in these types of arenas. Now, you're probably saying, why is there a Diana line? This woman's crazy. Well, I'll tell you why. Thorkel Son, who is the developer of this company, uses the metaphor to help you understand the amazing abilities of people with autism. Now, to most people, a dandelion is a troublesome weed in their lawn or garden. But it, given the right context, the dandelion is actually a medicinal tea for the liver. After way too many glasses of wine, which I guarantee you I will be having after this. <laughs> and it is also a healthy garden green for your salad. So Thorgel says, this is what it is about people with autism. In the right context, they are a powerful force in the workplace. But we have got to start forgiving their weaknesses and not only acknowledging, but highlighting their successes. So let me give you some examples. I give you Anthony Sterego, those ESPN fans out there like my son. 
probably saw this story. He has autism. He kicked the winning field goal for his high school team with 21 seconds left on the clock. It was his obsession with Rutgers football and this one particular game where the kicker won the game that led him to want to be the kicker. Well, for those of you who know anything about football, kicking is a repetitive behavior. You have to do it over and over again, and you do it in the same motion. It fell right into Anthony's lap, and he was the hero for his team. Alexis Weinman. She was the first contestant on Miss America with autism. It's pretty awesome, Miss Montana. When she was in high school, she joined the drama club because those kids, they accepted her quirkiness. And she found another way to communicate. She specialized in pantomime, and she ended up using comedy as her talent for Miss America. <coughs> then I show you John Elder Robinson. I just love this guy. I read his book, and it was awesome. He was diagnosed later in life with Asperger's, a high-functioning form of autism. And he had dropped out of high school for various reasons. And he became very obsessed and fixated with electronics and sound engineering because John had the ability to see complex electronic circuits that you and I would have no clue what he was looking at, but he could see it so precisely. And it was this obsession that led him to become the pyrotechnics engineer for the rock band KISS. For those of you who are my age, you know who KISS is. For the young students, maybe not. All right? And last, I give you British architectural artist Stephen Wilshire. Well, he's got pretty amazing talent. He has a very hyper-focused attention to detail and an unbelievable memory where he can look at detailed landscapings one time and draw them after seeing them one time. Here are four examples of people with autism whose disability led to their success. It was the characteristics that, in the end, when channeled in the right direction, helped them to be successful and became their strength. But let's face the reality here. There are many people with autism that will never get a job. And they'll never live alone. But I'm here to tell you that there are people with autism that can. And just because they're different, or because they have the label of autism, doesn't give us the right to push them away. Because if we do, we're shutting the door on people who can make a significant contribution in our society. We have to open our eyes and find them, open our minds to support them, and open your hearts and believe in them. All right, take out your flashlights now. Point them to the black curtains. Yes. In a world full of differences, help me burst the bulb and shine a new light, a bright light on people with autism and the abilities that they have and the similarities that we all share, not only with people with autism, but with each other. Because in the big scheme of things, we are all more alike than we are different, don't you think? And people with autism, they're just like us.